one of the annoying things that the instructors did every single time we spent time in the pool was they would swim around behind us and they would grab our masks and pull our masks off or they would grab our regulator and pull the regulator out of our mouth. Sometimes they would even swim up behind us and turn the air off on our tank. The whole idea of this process was to get it so that whenever we encountered an emergency underwater, it was just our natural reaction to know how to deal with the situation. And I, I remember for hours swimming around that pool and them pulling our masks and pulling our regulators, and I'm thinking, this is never going to happen in real life. We went and uh, did our certification dive, and a few months later, a friend of mine called me up and he said, hey, John, I have been wanting to dive in the lake where my parents have a, have a camp. Would you be interested in diving with me? And so one Sunday afternoon, we headed out to the lake to explore the underwater in that lake where his parents had a camp. Our first dive, we spent about 40 minutes underwater, swimming around, exploring uh, sunken trees, stumps, and even some other things that had sunk in the lake. And we surfaced and, and came back to the boat, climbed back in, changed our tanks out. We'd planned on doing two dives that day and kind of rested, spent a few, uh, a few minutes, about 20 minutes in the boat, just kind of recounting what we had been through. Got our second tank hooked up, and Harry went over the side of the boat and into the water and headed to the bottom. And I followed shortly afterwards, flipped over the side of the boat, and started to descend the 40 feet to the bottom of the lake. Just about the time I got to the bottom, I felt a tug on my regulator. And suddenly it was gone. No problem, I reached around behind to grab the regulator, but it wasn't there. Not only was the regulator not there, the tank wasn't there. The tank was gone. I looked in the distance to see Harry swimming around a stump about 40 feet away, and I knew instantly that what I had to do is I had to surface. Now, when you're out of air, 40 feet underwater, and you can only ascend one foot a second. That 40 seconds is an eternity. And I remember slowly going to the surface, reaching up and feeling my hand break the surface, and then my head, and I was able to take a breath of air. In my mouth as I was going up, I had spit out the remnants of my regulator mouthpiece because it had come apart when it had gotten pulled out of my mouth. And I swam over to the, uh, to the boat and was able to climb in. And what, what I discovered is that the nylon strap that held my tank in the backpack had stretched during our first dive. And I hadn't tightened it up enough so that when we went for the second dive, it was just waiting to fall out. The tank was still there. It was just way down by my knees somewhere. And I was able to get back in the boat. Harry came up, and he actually found all the parts of my regulator mouthpiece that I'd spit out. We put it back together again. We put the tank back in the backpack, strapped it in tighter this time, and then we went over the side and continued our dive. But I want you to know that what my instructors had done during my scuba class in constantly challenging us with all of these stresses saved my life because it wasn't just something I had to think about. What do I do? It had become ingrained in me how to respond when emergency struck. And because it was second nature, it just, I did it and didn't think about it. God wants in our lives our response to him to be second nature. Last week, Pastor Michael introduced us to the new sermon series on, uh, on the book of Ephesians, and he talked about how 
Ephesians 1 is all about us being in Christ. Chapter 2 talks about what that means. But before we get there, um, in uh, John chapter 16 and verse 13, John tells us, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he, for he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. And as we open God's Word today, I would like to invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us, to guide us into the truth as it is in Jesus. Loving Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have called us into your house today to worship you, and we invite your Holy Spirit to be here with us to guide us into your truth, not some human interpretation of truth, but the truth as it is in Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we dive into the second chapter of Ephesians, we find that Ephesians 2 is broken down into three different parts. The first part covers the first seven verses, and I'd like to read those with you today. And you were dead in your, tra in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lusts of, their, of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. And God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The first thing we find here is that in Ephesians 2 is that we were once dead, but now we have been made alive in Christ. In his book, uh, Just Like Jesus, Max Lucado tells the story of taking his young daughter to a playground which was just around the corner from the apartment where they lived. And one day, while, while he was there with his daughter at this uh, playground, he heard the familiar sound of the ice cream truck coming into the parking lot. And he thought, wouldn't it be neat to get his daughter a sweet ice cream treat while she's playing at the playground? And so, looking over to see that she's okay, he wanders over to the ice cream truck and buys her her favorite ice cream. And when he turns around to give her this ice cream, he discovers that she has grabbed a handful of dirt and stuck it in her mouth. Now, everyone who's a parent understands exactly that feeling. And as he was looking at this, where he had intended to place a treat, she'd filled it with dirt. Now, I want to pause the story right there for a moment. Ask yourself three questions. The first one, is she any less his daughter because she's filled her mouth with dirt? Absolutely not. She is still his daughter. And along with that, does he love her any less because she's got dirt in her mouth? Absolutely not. He loves her just the same. Now, here's the third question. Is he going to let her keep the dirt in her mouth? Again, absolutely not. You see, he loves his daughter too much to let her substitute dirt for the treat that he wants to give to her. And so he will take her over to the fountain and wash her mouth out with, with water so that she can enjoy the treat that he has planned for her. Now, he concludes this story by telling us that God loves you just the way you are. 
but he loves you too much to leave you that way. While we were yet sinners, while we were dead, Christ died to make us alive in Christ. At this point, Paul transitions to the next verse, um, and this is the second part of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works that anyone may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The second part of Ephesians 2 is that we were created for good works. God intends for us to do good things. That's what we were made for. And... The interesting thing about it is, is that it doesn't save us. He reminds us that in verse 8, that, you know, it doesn't save us. And our good works do nothing to make us saved. Our good works simply show who we serve. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, we're told, Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You see, the whole point of this is that God's got to look good. And he has chosen for some strange reason to look good through you and me. He didn't have to. He could have looked good any other way that he wanted to, but he chose to use what we do to make him look good. One of the things that I talk to my students about when I am teaching them about uh, public speaking is the concept that our, the message that we have to share is made up of three components. There are the words that we say, and interestingly, research has shown that the words that we say make up about 7% of the message that we communicate. The second part of communication is the tone of voice that we say those words in. Makes up about another 38%. Now, for the mathematicians out there, you will notice that that's only 45% of the message. We've all heard the statement that actions speak louder than words. The other 55% are ma- is made up of our body language or our actions. And so... Science has shown that actions do actually speak louder than words. Now, in marketing, one of the things that we want everybody to realize is that all aspects of the message need to be what we call congruent. Everything needs to be aligned up. And the message that we give is better received when our words, our tone, and our actions are all congruent. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18, we're told, Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. John is reminding us here that the message that we portray about Christ is directly related to the things that we do. How we behave displays, an, displays to the world a stronger message than what we say. Interestingly, um, Jesus uh, tells, this, uh, it tells the parable. Uh, Pastor Michael talked about this parable a few weeks ago in Matthew 25 where Jesus says that the king comes up to the righteous. He he separates the righteous and the unrighteous. And 
he comes up to the righteous and says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And the righteous' resp- response to this is very telling. You know, Pastor Michael told us that it was a reminder that when we do things for other people, it is also doing them for God. But the, the response here tells us something else in addition to that. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come, vis- and come to you? The message that is being, being told here is that the righteous, it has become so ingrained in them the way that they behave that they do not even know that they're doing it. Interestingly, the unrighteous, when, they're, when Jesus confronts them or the king confronts them, they say, when did we see you like this and not do it? They think that they are. But just like my scuba, scuba instructor knew that my safety depended upon me knowing how to respond in a crisis and it becoming second nature to me, Jesus understood and he was teaching us in this parable that your behavior is second nature. When we are doing things for Jesus, when we are doing things in Christ, it is second nature to us. We do it because it is who we are, not because it's something we're supposed to do. In, in Matthew um, chapter, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people, uh, to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Stop and think about that for a minute. Jesus is telling us that when we do our good deeds or whatever we do so that someone else will notice, that is all the reward that we have. He goes on to tell us, So, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, so that they may be uh, praised by the people. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your charitable giving will be in secret, and your Father which sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they will be seen by people. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, Close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus is reminding us here that it's not that we shouldn't be doing good things, but it's the motive behind why we do it. He reminds us that when we do it for somebody else to see, that is all the reward we've got. But when we do it for Him, we don't care whether someone is watching or not. In his, uh, in his play, A Murder in the Cathedral, T.S. Eliot makes a uh, very profound statement in relation to, uh, well, first of all, before we get there, focusing on actions causes us to seek those who can reward us. Focusing on relationships causes us to be rather than do. T.S. Eliot's statement in... in uh, uh, murder in the cathedral. It's the story of uh, Thomas Beckett, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And this is a historical play that was actually commissioned to be uh, performed in the Canterbury Cathedral, where the murder historically took place. And in the play and in real life, Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, had been exiled to France because he opposed King Henry II. And when he came back, it was sure he, he was sure he was going to be martyred. And in the play, he is faced with four temptations. The first temptation is to 
give in to the king and go back to being the king's friend, abandon what he believes was, was right. The second temptation was for him to go back to the political power he had before he became the archbishop. The third temptation was for him to lead a revolt and overthrow the king. But the fourth temptation was for him to go to martyrdom because martyrs received glory. And his statement in, result, in response to that, uh, that temptation, the last temptation is the greatest treason, to do the right deed for the wrong reason. In Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, 21 to 23, Jesus makes a very profound statement. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. If he were here in Keene, Texas, on October 14, 2023, might he be saying instead, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we go to church every Sabbath? And didn't we even believe in Ellen White? Weren't we even, didn't we even live a vegan lifestyle? Now, please, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that those are bad. But what Jesus is saying here is that when you do the wrong thing or the right thing for the wrong reason, it is lawlessness. You see, Jesus knew something that many times we forget. And what he knew is that action without relationship is meaningless. Relationship without action is not possible. You see, he knows that when we are in Christ, it is just the natural response to do good things. In my backyard, I have several grapevines. I don't have to go out to those grapevines every year and tell them, you need to produce grapes. Now, to be fair, I didn't get grapes from my grapevines this year. And that's because some critter decided that they wanted the grapes more than me. And they ate them all before they, before they matured. But I do not have to tell my grapevines that they need to produce grapes. Jesus tells us that he is the vine and we are the branches. And when we abide in him, we just naturally produce grapes, just like the grapes in my backyard. It's because when we abide in Christ, producing fruit is what we do. It's just the way it works. And with this, we transition to the third part. Therefore, and this is a reading on from chat verse 13, therefore, or verse 11, therefore remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel, and strangers to the uh, covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who has previously, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And in verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. The third part of Ephesians 2 is that you once were an alien in a foreign land, but now you are a citizen of the kingdom adopted by the king. 
And what that means is that it means that he has adopted you to transform you into something else. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. We, did not, we were not brought back to life to simply live the life we were living before. We were brought back to life to live a new life in Christ Jesus. In, in Romans 8 and verse 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that we would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So the idea here is that he is, uh, that we are being conformed to a new image of what he wants us to be. 1 Peter 1 and verse 15, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because we are in Christ, God is calling us to live a holy behavior. And finally, our Scripture passage in Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. We'll just read verse 2 here. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. God wants to transform us from who we were into who we were created to be. He wants us to be alive in Christ so that we can be all he wants us to be. On September 4, 2020, I received a text from my sister. And the text went something like this. My mother-in-law has some questions about the Seventh-day Adventist faith specifically about the Sabbath. Would you be available to talk with her and answer some of her questions? Now, you need to understand the background behind this text. You see, my sister was raised a Seventh-day Adventist, but when she graduated from high school, she did not walk away from the church. She sprinted as fast as she could go. She wanted to have nothing to do with the church or with God. She wanted to be as far away as she could be. And at this point in her life, she and her family were not involved with any church, did not have any kind of religious connection at all. And so, well, we were not able to make the next, the next day that she had asked for. We were able to schedule something the following, uh, following Sabbath. And so Sabbath evening on September 12, my wife and I drove to uh, my sister and her husband's house, and we were working there helping her get supper ready when her mother-in-law and stepfather-in-law arrived. And when Sally walked through the door, she had her Bible in her hand, she barely said hello when she started firing questions at me. What about the Sabbath? When was it changed? Why was it changed? What scriptural evidence is there for all of this? And I'm noticing out of the corner of my eye that my brother-in-law, Josh, is just really uncomfortable with this whole conversation. He's pushing back, and he's, saying, he's responding to the text that I'm giving them. Well, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what it means. And he's just really defensive of it. And finally, Sally turns to him and says, Josh, if God has not convicted you of this then that is not something you need to worry about. But he has convicted Mark and me, and we must follow. During supper, we continued the conversation, and then uh, after supper, we were out on their, their back deck, and uh, Josh had kind of wandered out into the backyard playing with the dog. The con conversation continued for about two and a half hours. And every now and again, Josh would come back in and he'd stick his head in and he'd, he'd make some comment. Of, That's not what the Bible says. In the conversation, it, it came out that uh, two weeks before, the previous Sabbath, Mark and Sally had found a Seventh-day Adventist church and had attended their first Seventh-day Adventist church service. And it was not a good experience for them. 
Fortunately for them, they went on and looked for a different church and found one that they really felt good about and started attending there. And as I, I was following kind of at a distance uh, over the next few months, um, about a month later, I noticed my sister posting on Facebook that she had gone to church with her mother-in-law that Sabbath and how blessed she was to be there. And then about three months later, Josh posts on Facebook inviting all of his friends to join them the next Sabbath for church at the Hickson's Tennessee Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, at this point, realizing that a transformation was happening in their lives, Lisa and I decided that we needed to start extracting ourselves from our current church that we were in and to move over to Hickson to support them. And I remember on May 22 of, of 2020, or 2021, I'm sorry, May 22 of 2021, sitting there in the Hickson Seventh-day Adventist Church in between Sabbath school and church, and Debbie turning around to me and saying, Josh and I have decided we want to be baptized. Would you baptize us? There was a problem with that. You see, I was leaving the next day to come to Texas to buy a house to move here. And my sister did not know that. And when I told her, she says, I guess that's not going to happen. And I says, you know something? If you're going to be baptized, I will be there. And over the next few weeks and months, I was able to conduct Bible studies with her and Josh via, via um, Zoom. And two years ago this weekend, I had the privilege of going back to Tennessee and baptizing my sister and her husband. It has been an amazing journey to watch them grow and watch them transform. Josh is now the head deacon of the Hickson, Tennessee Seventh-day Adventist Church, somebody who just three years ago wasn't even sure what he believed about God. The interesting thing is, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells us as he is getting ready to ascend to heaven, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and as far as the remotest part of the earth. You see, being a witness for God is not optional. The question is, what kind of witness will you be? God has got to look good. The question is, is how does he look through you? Thanks for stopping by. I hope and pray that this message was a blessing for you. If you'd like to see more content like this, we need your help. You can support the Keene Seventh Adventist Church media ministry by going to AdventistGiving.org, finding the Keene Seventh Adventist Church in Texas, and then putting in your donation to the media line. Your faithful giving and support allows us to spread the gospel online for you and others to participate in. Thank you for your continued support of the Keene Seventh Adventist Church. Thank you.